I would like to introduce the following people who are new members of West Press. Do they have to come up? Yes. Okay. Jason Brennan and Alicia Goff. Chris Brewster and Alice Steiner. <coughs> Jennifer Bosari, who I know is. Yep, oh, there you are. Hey! <coughs> you guys come up here on the stage. Tanka Cochran. Marley Edge. Walt Johnson. William Jones. Lori Kratiger. Never sit that far in, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michelle Laughlin. Jenny Lunsford. <clears throat> Alistair and Maricela McKenzie. Brian and Jeanette Tajjan. And Terry Williams. <clears throat> Last Sunday, these people were welcomed as members of West Press. They got their secret Dakota ring <laughs> and became a part of this community. They are here to tell you that they believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Hi, guys. Hello. Good to see you all. Jesus says this to you. You didn't choose me first. I chose you. I love you, and I thought of you while you were being knit together in your mother's womb. I died so that you would not have to. And now that you are standing here before these, your friends and your family, I declare that you are now part of a new family, called and appointed by me to live, to laugh and love together, to go and bear fruit together, and to build a kingdom of God right here. Friends, Jesus has chosen you. And in, his, in baptism, he has joined you to himself, he has called you together with us into this church, which is his body. Now, he has brought you to this time and this place so that you may confess his name and go out and serve him as faithful disciples. So I'd like to ask you these questions. What is your quest? <laughs> to seek the Holy Grail. <laughs> Who is your Lord and Savior? Do you trust him? Do you intend to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? And will you be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way? And will you seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may be? No, it's okay. <laughs> Today, as they are presented to us as new members of West Press, we baptize Jason Brennan and Terry Williams. Terry, come on down. Terry, do you desire to be baptized? Through baptism, we enter into the covenant that God has established. And within that covenant, what we are promised is new life. We are guarded by evil, from evil. <laughs> that would be a very important change. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> we are nurtured by the love of God and his community. On our part, we turn from evil and turn to Jesus Christ. And so I ask you to profess the faith of the church, to reject sin, and to profess your faith in Jesus Christ. Do you renounce evil and its power in the world which defies God's righteousness and love? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior? Do you intend to be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word, showing his love to your life's end? Do you, the members of this congregation, in the name of the whole church, promise through prayer and example to support and encourage Jason, Terry, Alicia, Chris, Alice, Jennifer, Tonka, Marley, Walt, William, Lori, Michelle, Jenny, Alistair, Maricela, Brian, and Jeanette to be faithful Christians. Will you actively... Oh, Wait, let say yes. Oh. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. Will you actively encourage them toward Jesus Christ? Will you love and affirm them in their pilgrimage through life and affirm their uniqueness as children of God? Then, with the whole church, let us stand and confess what we believe. It's on the screen behind you guys. You want to turn around and look at it? We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. For all then he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. We believe in the Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. We give you thanks, O holy and gracious God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the water, and you created all that is, seen and unseen. By the gift of water, you sustain all life. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil in the water of the flood. And by your saving ark, you gave a new beginning. You led Israel through the sea out of slavery into the freedom of the promised land. And in the water of Jordan, our Lord was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. By the baptism of his death and resurrection, Christ set us free from sin and death and opened the way to eternal life. We thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of baptism. For this water reminds us that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are buried by Christ in his death. By the power of your Holy Spirit, bless this water, that it may be for us a reminder of deliverance and rebirth. As all of us participate in baptism, you remind us that our sins have been washed away, that we have been raised to a new life and grafted into the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us who are baptized today, and especially Terry, that we may have the power to trust you and to do your will and to continue forever in the risen life of Christ, to whom with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours now and forever. Amen. Terry, I baptize you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Williams family is here uh, as a part of a journey that has taken them a long way. Anne Franklin, who's here, her husband passed away, Anne, how long ago? In 2000, Terry's dad. And because of that, they had his funeral here. And because of that, Snooky and Adrian Baird came and be a, were a part of our community, as well as Tanka, and uh, where is she? There she is, and Michelle, and Lauren, and all these other people. I'd like to ask Adrian to come up if you would and have a prayer for Terry. Would you give him the mic? This is my daughter, <laughs> surrogate daughter. Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, we thank you first for your love for us and that through your love you offered us grace and through your grace you offered us mercy through a plan so that we could be redeemed to be with you in this life as well as in the future. We ask your blessing upon Terry and we ask that you speak through her voice that you move through her arms and her legs and her body and that she will be your representative and do what it is that you would have her know, say, and do in this place among us. And we ask this as we give you the glory. Amen. Amen. Terry, would you step back up with your family up here now, your new family here? And Sarah? Jason, Alicia, Chris, Alice, Jennifer, Tonka, Marley, Walt, William, Lori, Michelle, Jenny, Alistair, Marichel, Marcella, Brian, and Jeanette, and Terry are received into the community of faith. God has brought them into this household of God and brought them to us through the promises of Christ and his church. I charge you, the people of this congregation, to nurture and to love these people and assist them to be faithful disciples. And this is what you're going to say to them. You're, you're being talked to here. Go ahead. There you go. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you into Christ's church. We are all one in Christ, and you are not alone. We promise to love you, encourage you, and support you. We promise to stand with you in your struggles and doubts and to minister alongside you. We will make mistakes. We will not be perfect. We will seek to own our mistakes and imperfections and share grace and live the wild adventure of Christ and his gospel identity with you. Let's give these new members a big hand, shall we? Thanks, guys. You may be seated. 
Morning, church. Hello, internet. It's about time you showed up. Um, <laughs> we are reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning, and it is Paul talking to the Corinthians, the first ones, um, and he's uh, kind of explaining uh, where he comes from, who he is, and more specifically, what they all believe, what, where, what their mini history has been, but it is actually, turns out to be, uh, a kind of creed. Um, so let's read together. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to read 3 through 11. Hear now the word of the Lord. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas. Everyone say Cephas. That's uh, Peter, actually. That's, uh, that's his Hebrew name, Cephas or Cephas. Then he appeared to uh, Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, Paul. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. Um. You guys are in a great church to be reading creeds like this. The Presbyterian Church is actually a great place to ask such, such questions because we hold the creeds uh, to be specifically uh, important and even hold them up a, a little bit higher in, in our kind of um, organization than a lot of other church denominations. And if you are asking yourself, what's a Presbyterian? And why did he say we? You're in a Presbyterian church. I don't know if you knew that. It's okay. It's going to be fine. You will slowly turn to ice over the years, uh, earning ourselves the moniker, the Frozen Chosen. Um, actually, you guys do a great job of defying that. Um, we, yeah, we Presbyterians actually hold this up. And we have two books that kind of run the show for us. One of them is called The Book of Order, and that has all of the kind of rules and regulations and methods and kind of how we do what we do and what we care about as a church. And then the second book is called the Book of Confessions. And the Book of Confessions is kind of like a compendium. It's a best of volume of all of the really cool catechisms, declarations, and creeds that we as the Presbyterian Church have affirmed over the, I, I, I want to say years, but years can be contained within a generation, and that would be foolish. So over generations... That's how deep and storied and significant and how long that we've been around. Uh, and we're just one of the, the younger denominations. Um, the church has been around for a long time, and we get connected to that with all of the creeds in proclaiming them. We have the Book of Confessions. We did all that. Good job, Jones. You're moving along fine. Um, uh, a good thing to think about when it comes to creeds is a creed is essentially um, a statement of belief. It's a statement of faith. It's kind of an outline of what we believe. It's kind of like a catchphrase or slogan, although it's a little bit more significant of that. And although, it, although today is important because we have Palm Sunday, which is the kickoff of, of, of Easter week and kind of the celebrations that we have for the next eight days, um, it's also an auspicious day today because Game of Thrones is coming back tonight, guys. And we need to recognize that greatness. Um, and that's important because within Game of Thrones, if you don't know what's going on, uh, it's a medieval story with dragons and swords and all that stuff. But there's a lot of old medieval houses. And by houses, I mean like families. And each one of those houses has a, a, a specific set of words that goes along with them. So for instance, uh, House Stark, which is like one of the central houses, is called Winter is Coming. That, that's what their words are, Winter is Coming. Uh, house, 
Targaryen, their words are fire and blood. And then the Lannister house, does anyone know the Lannister house words? What was that? A Lannister always pays his debts, which is actually not the house words. Uh, Their house words are actually, hear me roar. But the point of bringing this all up is because they aren't just words or slogans. They actually reveal a deeper core meaning, a deeper core belief, a, a deeper core character value that they hold. So when Stark, House Stark says winter is coming, they aren't just saying, hey, look, it's fall. Winter is going to be next. We know our seasons well. Uh, when, when they say winter is coming, what, they, what they're actually referencing is there are our family who lives in the north. And living in the harsh realities of the north means we are always going to be prepared. Winter is coming. Winter is coming when snows pile 12 feet high. Winter is coming, the time of year or the time or the season where our old um, family members will say, hey, we're going off to war or hey, we're going off hunting. They'll leave the house and never come back. They'll go die alone in the woods because they, they want to create more food for their children and their grandchildren so that their families can live. Winter is coming is a reference to the harsh reality that they live in. You guys know what I'm talking about? There's a little bit more going on than simply the the season is next. Uh, Targaryens, fire and blood, they have a high priority on their own specific bloodline, the Targaryen house, their own family, so blood. Uh, They are also the only uh, house, this is funny, um, that rides dragons. So they're going to be associated with fire, hence fire and blood. The the Lannisters, they have kind of two. So one of them is we, uh, what is it, what did I just say? Uh, Hear me roar versus the Lannister always pays her debts, it's, it's, if you know anything about the show or the characters in that, in that family, they're kind of duplicitous. They're kind of Geminis. They have two, uh, two lives. They might say one thing and go do another. So it's uh, no wonder that they have almost two, uh, two house words. It, it reveals something deeper, a deeper character value, a deeper core thing um, going on there. And that references the kind of creed that they live, they live under. Other famous creeds. Um, the creed of Islam. There is one God, Muhammad, and Muhammad is his prophet. That's an incredibly important creed because in a hundred years, that religion spread from Middle East to a third of the world in a hundred years. It took Christianity about a thousand years to accomplish that. So uh, well done, Islam. Um, good creed. Uh, another creed. Uh, which is a Jewish one, which is very famous. And it's also, also actually the only creed that Jesus ever spoke, which is called the Shema. Everyone say Shema. Shema, Shema means hear. And it's, it's a long word, is, is Shema Israel. And Jesus says it in Mark 12 when he's talking about um, uh, what, what's commandment. He's asked, which commandment is the best commandment of all? And he actually kicks it off with Shema. And then he says, love your God and love your neighbor. Um, and the Shema is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So if a creed is a statement of belief distilled and finely wordsmithed into one sort of cohesive little body, then they tend to have this remarkable ability to say a lot in very little time. Much like when we read our passage in Paul today, from Paul today, in 1 Corinthians, he kind of lists what they believe. Did you guys hear that? We believe that Christ died and Christ rose, and then he appeared to this guy and this person and this group and all that. Oftentimes, they will actually have the words, the Christians will actually have the words, I believe, in them, or we believe, in the actual creed. Christianity has a bunch of which has its benefits and its drawbacks. The main drawback is we as uh, people are petty and we're idiots. And we can't disagree with one another. So if I'm a part of a church and we have a creed, but I don't like the creed, well, then I'll just leave because I'm petty and an idiot, remember? And I'll go start my own church across the street with my own creed, right? Um, So that's part of the reason why we have so many creeds left and right. But there's also a positive benefit that goes along. A good part about it, though, is that some creeds don't grow out of bitterness. Instead, they grow out of the times and demands of the culture we live in. 
A good greed tends to answer the most important and fundamental question that Jesus ever asked his disciples. Who do you say that I am? That's what a creed tries to really get at. Who do you say, who do you say that I am? There's a great creed out of the Maasai people of Africa, of East Africa. They say that Jesus was always out on safari and that when he died and was buried, the hyenas did not touch him, which is a beautiful rendition of the same truth that we know, but said to and by the culture and people that they are. Another great creed is actually called the Barman Confession, written in 1934 in Barman, Germany, an auspicious time in an auspicious place. And it was an effort by very courageous Christians in Germany, led by one of my favorite personal theologians, Karl Barth, that denounced, that denounced the Nazi faction of Christianity at the time. Nazi Germany had kind of hijacked Christianity, and they said, we don't believe that Jesus is a Jew and a whole bunch of other astounding things. And Christians within Germany said, no, we're standing for truth. The Barman Declaration is actually found at the end of our book of confessions because it's one of the most recent confessions and, and declarations that we have. And go look it up. Go Google it later. It's short. It's totally readable. readable. It has like six points, and it is, it's beautifully articulated. And it has um, some poignant things to say about our cur current cultural environment. So I really encourage you, go read the Barman. Everyone say Barman. Barman, Barman Declaration, Barman Germany. There is one creed, though, that is accepted throughout all three branches of Christianity. So we've got Eastern Orthodox, we've got the Catholic Church, and then we've got all of the Protestant denominations. And all of Christianity recognizes the Nicene Creed of 325. We've read it before, and we're going to read it now. But as we read it now, I want you to identify um, the, the incredible detail that goes into each one of the sentences was put into each specific word in these creeds. They're very highly wordsmithed. Uh, Ask questions of it when we read it together. What makes sense? What doesn't make sense? What, uh, what bits do you recognize from the Apostles' Creed that we all just read? Try to find the consistencies and, and then point out the differences. Let's, let's read this together. Maybe. Maybe not. Hey. Oh, good job. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord. I'm going to read from this one. Only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all words, light of lights, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who sits, who with the Father and the Son is worship and glorified, who spoke to the prophets, and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Church, perhaps the most important piece of that creed, perhaps the most important piece of creeds brings 
to the formation of identity, to the formation of an identity with Christ, of us identifying with Christ, and clarifying uh, our belief and faith is the reality that it connects us with the living church throughout both space and time. What we just read, the statement of our beliefs, the Nicene Creed, was read and believed in the Philippines this morning. It was also read and believed in the 6th century by the Emperor Justinius. It was also read and believed in the 13th century by Thomas Aquinas. It was also read in the 20th century by Karl Barth and Martin Luther King Jr. just a generation ago. This practice we have of hitting every week, of saying the, the Lord's Prayer, of continuing these type of rituals and repetitions forms in us an identity, but it also connects us to something that is infinitely bigger than us. It transcends time and space so that all Christians everywhere, over the world, can read this this morning, affirm its belief. And we then get connected, much like Paul read earlier, which comes from the Book of Order, that you are now a part of a new family. And that family does not die. It continues on from here into forever. All the generations that came before us are connected to us and with us, to Jesus, through Things like this creed and the creeds and the practices and the rituals that we say. Furthermore, not only does it connect us to every generation that came before, it also connects us to every generation that comes after. So those of us who are grandparents and know the incredible value of grandkids and how we just lose our minds and love them so much, imagine great-grandkids, great-great-great-grandkids, great-great-great-great-great-grandkids who also share in that giant family that living church. When Jesus and Paul talk about the body of Christ, that's what they're talking about. It's a body that transcends space and time, and creeds connect us to one another through it. Therefore, it is important to participate in them. It's important to participate in the reading of the creeds, to sit in awkwardly and have your leader mess up reading because he's bad at words. <laughs> it's important to say the, the Lord's Prayer every week, because it connects us to that living tree, that living life, that living church that expands through space and time. That forms an identity. The different practices that we uh, have seen, they're, today is so rife with them. We've got Palm Sunday where we rave, wave branches. Why? But we do it because it connects us to something infinitely bigger and greater and older and more powerful than us. We baptize with the same water because it does the same thing. We've said two creeds today. Woo! <laughs> like, we're hitting all of the bases today. We are connecting ourselves in very substantial, real ways to a living church that lives far beyond us in our own time. It's important to participate in Easter next week, whether it be show up and stay for both services, because one service you're going to be here, and the next service you're going to help out with kids. Or one service you're going to help out with kids and the next service you're going to be here. It's important because some people come to church one day a year and that day's on Easter. It's important for some of us to dress formally because people who come to church one day a, week, one day a year will see you and be like, oh yeah, that, this is home. I know what this feels like. It's important to, for some of us to not dress formally so that people who are like, oh no, that guy's wearing a suit. What's going on there? But I'm not. And then they see you and you're dressed casually, and they, they, they'll feel at home. It's important for us to share our smiles, to people, for people to see our, our, what is it, happy, shining faces. <laughs> it's important next week for the members of this community to show up and really be members of this community, to let them know that they are participating in something bigger, better, and greater than themselves, which is what we all do every week. It's important to celebrate Easter because we've been celebrating Easter ever since the first Easter. You know, when Christ rose from the dead and rocked everyone's face off. It's like, what? This is happening? Yeah, it's happened. And now you have to deal with that. And he's been begging history to deal with that ever since. And next week, we get to stand with a group that is still alive today that has stood with 
Christ, generation after generation, that transcends both time and space. It's a privilege, and it's also a joy and responsibility. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for uh, being bigger than time, being bigger than space, transcending uh, beyond our current day and week that might be stressful. Thank you for pulling us out of our small, t very, very tempor temporary view of what life is like and connecting us into something that is so much richer and bigger and whole and full. A life of your body. May we figure out what it means to declare what we believe. May we continually refine that and teach us what it even means in the first place. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.